Damaged Defenders by Sherza. Chapter 103. Loki. Loki had been tempted to offer to teleport everyone to the castle. He had, however, realized that arriving by more ordinary means was as much a part of the message they wanted to send as the rest of the attack. Though he deeply appreciated Steve giving him a carte blanche to do what he did best, hit and fade fighting was Loki's bread and butter, whether he was using magic or not. He'd never seen the appeal of standing toe to toe with an opponent and beating the egg out of each other. He much preferred to get away with as little damage to himself and as much damage to his opponent as possible. After Sam bailed out, Agent Barton and Natasha set the jet down in a clearing in the forest. The clearing was close enough to allow them to get to and from the castle quickly while still keeping the jet out of sight. They had each been issued comms, so it was a matter of listening quietly for a minute or two while Tony, primarily, blew a hole in the perimeter security. To Hydra's credits, it took less than a minute for their people to swarm out of the castle in response to the surprise attack. That, however, seemed to be the limit of their capability, as apparently not uh, one of them could get a beat on Tony or Sam. Not that Loki wanted either man hurt, but you'd think the idiots would have at least fair aim with the weapons they used. Worse, none of them seemed to have cottoned on to Thor's presence despite him not making any effort to stay out of sight overhead. Though it was possible, they simply didn't have anything capable of shooting down something at that height and so had no choice but to leave Thor be. I will teleport the two of you if you so wish. Loki offered to Natasha and Barton. Natasha, he was fairly sure, would accept. Barton, on the other hand, might have been understandably leery of putting himself in Loki's hands thus. Loki would have been in the same circumstances. So Loki was pleasantly surprised when both of them indicated their agreement. As soon as a hole had been blasted in the security perimeter, the jet emptied, save for the three of them and Bruce. Natasha and Martin quickly chose balconies to be teleported to, and Loki brought them to their chosen spots, then teleported himself to a third balcony. They had arranged themselves such that they formed a roughly equilateral triangle between them, spread over three floors. Barton and Natasha had taken the highest floors, while Loki had taken the lowest with a balcony. He presumed that the two agents intended to eliminate the non-combatant Hydra agents, whether they were so-called scientists or observed some other function, that remained on those floors, then worked their way down. Loki, on the other hand, fully intended to sow as much chaos as could be managed among the combatants themselves, so had needed to be among them. The first thing he did was turn their bullets into paintballs, ones of a shade of red that matched fresh blood, so that it would take them longer to realize there was a problem and find different guns or ammo chips. Not that they seemed to be having much luck hitting any of the Avengers, but now if they did, the Avengers would come to no harm until Hydra realized what had happened and fixed the problem somehow. Not taken care of, Loki turned his attention to other matters. First came a subtle confusion spell. Nothing so obvious or immediate as to make Hydra agents wander around in circles or the like, but enough to slow their decision-making abilities down gradually the longer the fight went. Not that Loki thought the fight would last all that long, but it was better if no one realized there was something wrong. Second came a spell to further skew their already atrocious aim to prevent them from injuring the Avengers. Loki didn't normally use that spell because projectile sent awry had the potential to hit innocence. Here, however, the spell was perfectly fine as the only other people in range for the bullets to hit were Hydra goons. By the time he'd woven those spells, such was the Avengers' rage that there were a number of dead Hydra scattered about outside. It gave Loki an idea. An evil... Awful, absolutely hysterically funny idea. Best he forewarned the Avengers of this one, though. Be advised, I am about to make it appear as if the dead are zombies. Loki said into the comm he'd been given and largely ignoring until then. No one had sounded particularly alarmed, so he'd had no need to tune into what was being said. There was more than one laugh between the other chatter on the comm line. Zombies, Loki? That's mean. I love it. Came from Bruce, the only one, thanks to not being in the battle yet, with the luxury of time to respond with more than a laugh.
Loki started weaving the spell. He was not making actual zombies, of course. He was merely arranging for the dead bodies to move about under his power and seem to be zombies. As with the other spells, he didn't have all the bodies rise up at once and start running around. He started with one body at the very edge of the action and slowly increased the number of zombies from there. Once that spell started working, he finally went inside the castle proper. By then, the other Avengers had all made it into the castle, which made it somewhat more imperative to intervene in what was going on inside the castle. The first thing Loki did was seal the castle tight, locking the Hydra agents inside it while allowing the Avengers to come and go as they pleased. Then he pulled a real oldie out of his arsenal. This spell made the target hear whispers, never loud enough to discern what was being said, and never from a clear direction. It also made the target see movement out of the corners of their eyes, but only when there wasn't actually any movement to be perceived. If the target was unlucky enough to have an Avenger near them and trying to sneak up on them, the target would see nothing. Sadly, despite the confusion spell, Hydra did finally notice their guns were not right and did something about it, evidently by breaking out some World War II classics from the chatter Loki heard on the comm. Before Loki could come up with a solution, Tony did, dropping everyone outside in one fell swoop. The good news was that the Hydra goons inside the castle were not yet employing those guns, probably because they ran a much greater risk of disintegrating either their own people or something important to their cause. With the action outside contained, Loki brought the increased number of zombies inside the castle to sow chaos there. After that, it was mostly monitoring for unexpected developments. Oh, and sitting back and watching the fruits of his labors. The results of the zombie smell were more than he could have hoped for. The Hydra goons, already on edge, facing off against Winter Soldier and an extremely pissed off Captain America, almost universally fell into sheer blind gibbering terror in the face of zombies being added to the attack force. It really didn't help that Loki had ensured the zombies acted correctly. That is, shambling about, apparently biting and infecting living opponents and the like. The biting and infecting only happened when a zombie was close enough to a hydrogoon that had just been shot or otherwise killed that the zombie body blocked hydrogoon's view of the real source of the new death. Roughly half of the surviving goons dropped their weapons and ran screaming when they finally started noticing the zombies. Of course, the situation being what it was, they ran screaming straight into the Avengers and their weapons, which added more zombies to the roster. Combined with the confusion spell and dealing with exceedingly pissed off Avengers, it took remarkably little time for goons to start curling up in balls and gibbering in fear, standing stuck still in wide-eyed horror and the like. As the resistance crumbled, the Avengers began to actively sweep the castle for stragglers and secret passages. They had run into a large number of goons, but only one or two agents of any rank thus far. Nor had they found any sort of control room for the security measures, never mind anything else. What they had found was a lot of labs, with a lot of stuff in them. At least one of which had something to do with Barnes's situation, given he flatly refused to go anywhere near the door. Never mind, into the room. Given he'd apparently had either no problem at all or only minor problems with the other labs, that was a rather big tell. From the look of the equipment in the room, according to Clint, who'd been the first to look, the room had likely been repurposed since Barnes had had been in it. However, I recognize a lot of this stuff from Foster's lab, Clint said over the comm. Don't think there's anything here now that could hurt someone unless it blew up. It was Logan, by dint of his enhanced hearing and knocking on walls with his fists, that found the hollow space hidden behind what looked like a stone wall in one of the storage rooms. Since no one had the patience to find the opening mechanism, Clint used an explosive arrow to blow the stone out of their way. They found an elevator shaft, the elevator apparently at the bottom. Right, Anzar, we're going to have a party waiting on us at the bottom, Clint asked. Really damn good, Logan growled. Hello, me, Logie said, then teleported down to the inside of the elevator. From there, he cast a spell that allowed him to see what was going on on the other side of the door. 
Answer. A lot of people with very big guns and other weapons all focused on the elevator. None of the guns were the blue energy type, however. That meant that Loki could turn the ammunition into paintballs with impunity and put the skewed aim spell on everyone. The bladed weapons, he turned to rubber. The other weapons, all variations on tasers and dart guns whose darts were loaded with who knew what, he simply broke the triggers on so they would not work. That done, he teleported back to the group. Have fun, he told them. I disabled all the weapons I could perceive. They might still have one or two things hiding somewhere, but most of their weapons won't harm you. He got rather a lot of very feral grins before the gang all dropped down the elevator shaft. Logan used his claws to cut out the roof of the elevator, then the elevator doors. The rest of the Avengers poured into the basement area behind him. Loki strolled along in their wake, making sure those few not killed didn't cause any trouble as the Avengers stormed through the floor. Logan had to cut their way through three doors, one of them an enormous thick blast door, before they finally got into the control room. And that's when they finally hit Peter, because here finally was Baron Von Strucker. By the look of him, not the man that had helped fund Hydra during Steve's time, but his son or grandson. He was far too young looking, not being white haired or otherwise visibly elderly to be anything else. And that man's son and daughter, standing to either side of him, weapons drawn. For all the good, that would do them. Before anyone could say anything, Clint, half hidden behind the other Avengers, shot all three of them with the darts that the science team had put together. Good job, Hawkeye. Steve growled, even as the rest of the Avengers brought down the rest of the people in the control room in rapid succession. Steve knelt to check for a suicide tooth or other means of suicide, and for the first time found what he was looking for. Evidently, the average goon was kept ignorant enough of Hydra's plans to not need to suicide. At least that was the explanation Loki was going to go with for now. All three Struckers had some means to end their lives on their persons. The two adults had small syringes, which apparently worked like something called an EpiPen. Loki made a note to look that up later. In a pants pocket while their father had a suicide tooth. All the control room staff also had either a syringe or a tooth, which they had seemed to depend entirely on their age. The older staff all had teeth, while those under the age of about 40 all had syringes. Loki decided the difference was less because of a change in Hydra methodology and more because of advances in poisons and the possible methods of applications thereof. It took another four hours to quadruple check that they'd found everyone, once they had, Loki finally dropped all the spells he'd cast, hauled the still-living Hydragoons and the Struckers to the jet, pull every bite of data from the computers and locate and transfer all the paper files. All that done, the heavy hitter Avengers, finally including Bruce, turned their attentions to the castle proper while the rest of the Avengers, including Loki, sat back, watched the fun, and cheered their teammates on as they reduced the castle to, quite literally, a smoking hole in the ground between them. Loki had no real way to be sure, but it looked to him like Hulk had had entirely too much fun tearing the castle apart. He probably got a kick out of not only being allowed to wreck the crap out of something, but having people alongside him helping wreck the crap out of things. And it was an unquantified success in the whole teach Hulk to work with a team arena. He had it balked once. Nor had he turned his destructive attention anywhere else. He'd also demonstrably remembered them, bellowing out the names of the Avengers he spotted in a distinctly gleeful tone. It was, of course, rather a long way from true teamwork, but it was a very promising start, and as good a way as any Loki could think of to end what had otherwise been a very bad day on a fairly good note.